each year as we keep the Feast of Tabernacles, there's a particular passage that we go to and repeat. It's a very remarkable passage. It's in Zechariah chapter 14. In verse 1, it introduces this passage by saying, Behold, the day is of the Lord is coming. We skip ahead to verse 4. It says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And then looking ahead to verse 9, it says in that, in, at that time, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day it shall be, The Lord is one, and his name one. We know that's going to be a very remarkable time in human history that all the names of various foreign gods, whether it be a Buddha or Allah, are all going to be forgotten. And the only name that will exist is the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and his Father. In that setting, as Jesus Christ is King of Kings, we then often read in verse 16 regarding God's holy day, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall come to pass, in verse 16 of Zechariah 14, that everyone who was left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. As we read this passage at the feast, the emphasis that we normally take note of is that they're going to come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, this passage goes on to say that those nations that do not, God's going to directly deal with them. And the end result will be that all nations will come to keep the feast. But in this message, I would like to point out the first part of the statement of the conduct of the nations, and that is that they will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. We all know that as we keep God's holy days, we worship God. But at the same time, brother, we don't tend to emphasize that and talk too often about our personal worship, the very goal and purpose of what we do and some of the things we practice, that it is to worship our creator. The emphasis here, if you look at it, is actually first, the first focus is that they go up to year, from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. The second emphasis is that then of obedience to God's instruction, which is a part of worship, and that is to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We also find in the New Testament another holy day mentioned, and this is in regard to the spring holy days. In the New Testament, we read in the book of John of Jesus Christ literally being honored by the masses, what is often referred to as his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It's on occasion here that followed the resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, the physical resurrection of Lazarus drew a tremendous amount of attention. In John chapter 12, we read first in verse 9, it says, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. In other words, that Christ had come up to Jerusalem and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So they came literally motivated by the physical resurrection of Lazarus, which the Bible reveals to us was not simply dead for a few hours or even for a day, but for several days and was prepared for burial when Jesus Christ came and he was brought to life. And so that incredible miracle spread throughout the land. And we read in verse 13, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come up to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. 
They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. At this time in history, the Jewish people who had the word of God based on the prophecies of the Old Testament look for a king. They did not understand, nor was it revealed to them by God, that Christ would come first as their Savior, as a sacrifice for sin. Today, we acknowledge, Christianity acknowledges, the first coming of Christ as our Savior, but they ignore the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come again, but this time as King of Kings. This occasion was for the spring holy days. Now, What's also interesting is in verse 20. It says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came up. But I point out the focus here is that they came up to worship at the feast. And brethren, do you in your mind often think in terms of attending God's holy days, whether it's the Feast of Tabernacles, whether it's the Days of Unleavened Bread, or Pentecost, the Day of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, do you think of those as occasion that your presence is there to worship God? We have certainly properly emphasized in God's church the importance of our relationship with Jesus Christ and with our Father. We've emphasized very, very importantly the fact that we are to obey God and keeping his holy days and keeping his Sabbath. But it's not too often we discuss the issue of actually worshiping God. And this sermon is to focus on that particular aspect of our practice, that we worship our creator, that we worship God. In the book of Hebrews, the apostle Paul addressed the topic of the Sabbath day. In Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, he did so by quoting from the Old Testament in the book of Psalms. And the passage he quoted from, as we read in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He goes on again to reiterate the same message because his focus here eventually is the promise of or the result of obedience to God's Sabbath, which is to be a partaker of the rest of that God has in store during the millennial reign of Christ. He says then in verse 13, it says, exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Again, he repeats this in verse 15. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And he goes on to explain then and carry out the logic of of his thought in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, Let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. It's an interesting statement that Paul clearly understood that the gospel message was was taught in the Old Testament and particularly to the children of Israel. We read then in verse 3, It says, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath that they should not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached do not enter in because of disobedience. 
Again, he designates a certain day saying in David. So he's very clearly talking about the seventh day. And he's saying that in the book of Psalms, David again designates this specific day by saying today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So he makes it very plain that even though they in Joshua kept God's Sabbath, that was not the rest that was pictured by the Sabbath. That rest, that promise remains yet for a future fulfillment. Based on that understanding, he goes on to say then, verse 9, there remains therefore a rest. Or as the Greek word is used, sabbatismos, which could also and perhaps be better translated as a keeping of the Sabbath for the people of God. Now, what I'd like to point out, when David wrote these words by God's inspiration in the book of Psalms, and that is recorded in Psalm chapter 95, notice how he stated we are to approach God's Sabbath day. In Psalm chapter 95 and verse 1, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. You know, brethren, as we start a Sabbath service, we start with song. We start praising God. And it's very important we understand that. That's a part of. It's not something we do by only tradition or that becomes routine. But it's really and truly an opportunity that each of us have in singing to sing from the heart and to praise our creator, to praise God. And as David says here, to shout joyfully to him. It goes on in verse 4, excuse me, verse 3. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. David is describing the spirit, the attitude, the heart, and the very practice of what we do when we keep God's Sabbath day. That we come to worship and bow down before our maker. I wonder how often, brother, we think of that in keeping God's Sabbath or perhaps in making the decision that, well, the weather's bad or it's been a tough week or we're a little bit low in finances. Do you realize that this is an opportunity and actually God's instruction to us to come and to worship him, to worship him together with our brethren, to collectively bow down in our hearts, to understand that what we're doing is not just about ourselves or our needs or to fulfill our personal needs. It is, in, in fact, a part of it is to worship God. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 24, when the apostle Paul was asked and put on trial regarding his faith, he summarized his practice and his belief before Felix. It's in Acts chapter 24, and in verse 14, and he confessed to Felix, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. You know, it's interesting that Paul lived in a time and in a culture 
where the Sabbath was basically physically observed, when God's holy days were an occasion when people assembled. It's completely different than our time, and yet because of Paul's practice, his belief, he says very clearly that he worshiped according to the way which they call a sect. Now, in our society, the people of God, those who keep God's Sabbath, those who observe his holy days, we're often referred to as a sect, but it's from a completely different perspective. We have separated from paganism. We have separated not from Jewish practice, but rather from practices of a Christian faith that has adopted a way of worship, a way of recognizing Christ, not according to the word of God, but according to the traditions of men. In this case, those traditions have been drawn from how other men have worshiped their gods. Now, Paul makes it very plain also that in his worship, he says, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Because he believed all things. And he emphasizes that, that it actually did in his time, in his age, separate him and was the foundational reason that what was practiced in the church of God and by the people of God was identified in their age as a sect. The foundation of our identity remains the same. It's because we worship believing God's word and putting God's word above the traditions of men. Now, it's very important we understand that. There are many passages in the Old Testament that address how we worship God in relationship to our practices. And I'd like to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12 because it's very succinct and it has a very clear emphasis that is relevant to the time in which we live and also is very clear regarding why during the time of the Apostle Paul, the way he worshiped, even though he believed and practiced the very word that the Jewish people looked to, they still called what he did the practice of a sect, and they rejected it. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, in verse 29, the scripture records, when the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, God says then, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You know, the point here is not that they would begin now to worship other gods, The point is very clear. God's saying, and his concern was, that they would take the practices of how others worship their gods and try to apply that in their worship toward the true God. God says, don't do that. Now, I cannot tell you how many times in my life, and I'm sure it's also been the experience of each of us, to have someone, we've talked with them and say, well, you know, why don't you keep Christmas? And we respond because of its pagan origins. And their response is very quickly, well, they're aware of that, or they've read about that, or they know about that. But they do it to honor Christ. The Scripture plainly tells us then, verse 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. The Bible is very specific. God's telling us, you do not take practices that we have learned from others and somehow try to adopt them into our relationship with God. We do not worship him in that manner. Now, the Bible then mentions in extreme an abomination to God, 
It says, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Now, we might look at that and, and think of that as being extreme, which it certainly was. But it's important to understand why did they do it and what was the reason? And why does God in particular mention this example? Well, I think first because it was the extreme. But underlying this sacrifice to burn a son or to sacrifice a daughter was actually a different approach than what we should ever have toward our Creator. Their belief was that through their supreme and ultimate sacrifice, they could demand of their God a response that He could not ignore their request, that he had to respond because of what they had done. You know, that kind of philosophy or that type of thinking is not in God's word. Now, there are examples that Christ used of an individual, a Pharisee, a very self-righteous man who went to God in prayer. And his prayer was that because of his righteousness, because he tithed and because he fasted and because he did these things, that God would hear him. And Jesus Christ pointed out an example who, of an individual who went to God in humility, asking for forgiveness, who did not bring forth any good works, but simply asked for God's mercy. And Christ made it very plain that the individual that God would hear was the one who had that kind of spirit, that kind of heart. Now, you might think, well, how does this relate to our present day? Well, in this particular case, in this example, I look back at my own youth. I grew up in the Catholic Church and participated as a youth in communion, my first communion, I recently was, a few years ago, going through family hand-me-downs and the things that my mother had after her death, and in that I found my first communion picture as a child. I was probably five, six, seven years of age, I probably about six or seven, and I well remember as a youth that I would go to church, but I would go to confessional first. And in confessional, if you have a Catholic background, you know that you start by, as you enter the confessional and you're acknowledged by the priest, you say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And then you begin to go through your transgressions. Now, as a result of that, I quickly learned as a youth that if that time of my transgressions was a long period, in other words, that I had uh, much to confess that as I walked out the door, I had a lot of penance. I also began to realize that if I did not have very much to confess, that my penance varied and would be much less. Now, whether thought through or not, by those involved, but certainly by Satan, I was being taught at a very young age that what I did how long I went through Hail Marys and Our Fathers and by repetition and by the time spent in doing penance that God would react in forgiveness. And I was being taught something that is actually very similar to the foundation of verse 31. That by my conduct in terms of my actions I could require of God his forgiveness, or his action. Now, brethren, that's something that it took me years in God's church to understand that way of thinking, to realize I had to overcome that. I had to separate from that. Mr. Herbert Armstrong, many years ago, I heard him bring out the fact that in the process of conversion, one of the important first steps is to unlearn, is to literally recreate in your mind and heart your relationship and your practice with God. Over these years, I've come to realize that's an ongoing aspect of our conversion, and it's something from time to time we have to reexamine. 
And whether you're Protestant or Catholic, whatever particular experience you may have had, it's very important that you do not allow it to influence your thoughts today or your actions. Now, in this particular case, God goes on in verse 32 to say, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. When the Apostle Paul walked the earth, the fault of the Jews was that they added to God's word and to his instruction. Notice in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 7, and I'll quickly go through this. It's something very worthwhile to study in detail to understand it. It's an occasion when the Pharisees literally sought Christ. They wanted to speak with him, with the scribes. But in doing this, they saw some of Christ's disciples eat, as it describes in verse 2, with unwashed hands. Now, if you don't read this carefully, you might think, well, the disciples just had come off the field and their hands were dirty and perhaps had dung on them, and, and they went into the marketplace and started eating. I don't believe that's true at all. But they did not follow the traditions of the Jews. Notice, as this tradition is described in verse 3, it says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews. So this had become not only a religious practice, it had a religious foundation, but it also had become a practice even of the rest or the balance of the Jewish people. That's not unlike what's happened in our society. There are many, many people who keep Christmas who are not religious. There are many people who observe Easter or have other practices that have their origins in a religious practice, but they're not religious. They don't necessarily go to church on those occasions, but nevertheless, they decorate their house or they give out candy on Halloween. It has become a part of the culture. In this particular case, this practice had become a part of the culture of the Jews. It says they do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. It wasn't that the disciples of Christ did not wash their hands. They did not do it in the special way that was prescribed by, as we read on, holding the tradition of the elders. I'm sure, brethren, the reason was because they did not see Christ follow those traditions. If you were with Jesus Christ, you knew that he was the very son of God, and you saw him follow certain physical practices, you would imitate him. They imitated Christ who did not follow the traditions of men. It separated them. It separated them not only from the Pharisees in certain areas and aspects of life, it also separated them from the Jewish community. We read on in verse 5, it says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Notice how Christ answered. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He goes on, verse 9, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. Now, Christ goes on and uses a more specific example to make his point, that of one of their practices where they put their practice above the instruction and very commandment of God. But my point, brethren, is that we need to examine how we worship and what our thoughts are. We need to be clear in our understanding of why we do what we do, even in the church of God. 
that you do not take for granted when you come to services, that the song service and having your heart in it and, and literally in the prayers that are stated, when we're led in opening prayer, we're led in closing prayer, that you pay attention and that your heart is in it, and you have thoughts to add to it that you do so before God. Because you're in his presence, you are there worshiping him. Now, when we keep God's Sabbath, it's also important to understand that in doing so, brethren, God's a part of our practice. Notice here in 1 John Because keeping God's Sabbath, one aspect that we look forward to is the fellowship. And it's a very important aspect of the Sabbath. In 1 John, in verse 3 of chapter 1, John wrote, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You know, he is saying that when we come together and we're with brethren and we fellowship with one another, that truly our fellowship, our discussion includes the Father and the Son. Now, what basis did he say that? It's interesting. Turn back to the book of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, and it's talking about the end time. As you read through this particular book, you find it literally concludes with the return of Jesus Christ, the events that will take place just before that time, and even talks about those things that will take place with the return of Christ. In that context, going back to chapter 3, and you can read that in verse chapter 4, starting in verse 1 on through verse 6. But just be prior to that, in chapter 3 and verse 16, it talks about those individuals who feared the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. It's interesting. Here, God's people, it says, spoke often or spoke to one another. And when they did, it says the Lord listened. God was a partaker. And that's why John wrote what he did. That when we fellowship on God's Sabbath day, it's not just for ourselves. It's not just about self. That literally, God listens. He's a part of what we discuss, what we say. He goes on to tell us then in the same verse, So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves the, him. And so the Bible is very clear. When we keep God's Sabbath, we come together in services and we fellowship with one another, that our fellowship is not just at a human level, that God hears and he listens. And as John said, truly our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. It's important, brother, we understand that. It's important we participate in it. It's important we understand how God seeks individuals to worship him, that we have a tremendous opportunity and a privilege. In John chapter 4, in the New Testament, in the gospel, Jesus was confronted by a Samaritan woman at the well. And as he spoke with her, and they spoke about the subject of worship, she said in verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. Of course, they had worship in a specific place, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Christ said to her, verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming 
when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. See, God had given them his word. Now, Christ made it very plain, as we read in Mark chapter 7. He said, in vain do you worship me. Why? Because what they did was not according to God's word or his instruction, but based on the tradition of men. They had gone in the other direction, and that is they had added to God's word all of these laws and, and requirements that were not from God's word. In our society, we live in a society that is taken from, in a different way, the practices of others in worshiping their gods. But what does God seek? The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Do you worship God with that foundation in your mind and heart? Do you think and discuss at times whether it be to keep God's Sabbath or to go to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that I'm going up to worship God? It is certainly proper for us to do so in obedience to God. But you know, brethren, as you read the Word of God, you realize there's an element here where it says we're going to worship God. We're literally there to praise Him, to glorify Him, to have a focus on His very person, to worship Him. In verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That it has to be from the heart, and it has to be based on God's instruction. In Malachi chapter 1, this is a book where the priesthood, in many ways, is indicted by God's servant with God's very instruction. And a part of it was because they had literally, in some ways, come to despise the very name of God, what it stood for, the sacrifice involved in serving God. And in many areas also, they simply ignored God's word. And this particular book in chapter 1 and verse 6, God asked a question. He said, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence? Now, there are many aspects of worshiping God, and in the time that I have in this message, brethren, I'd like to address a few of them. And the first of those is to honor God, that we would honor Him. You know, it's interesting, that's very important to God. In fact, the Scripture reveals to us that Jesus Christ will become our judge. Now, God had a purpose in doing that. Judgment was given to Christ specifically so that we would honor the Son even as we honor the Father. So the subject of honor is very important to our Father in heaven. Notice here in John chapter 5, in verse 22, it says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, why? The Bible reveals it to us, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You know, our judgment will be before the throne of Jesus Christ. But rather than it is so that we would honor him, because it is human to honor someone who has authority over us and who ultimately will make the judgment regarding our life. 
In this case, it's the very promise of life, eternal life, that has been given to Christ so that we would honor him. Now, how can we honor God? There's a few points that are literally brought out very specifically in the Bible that I would like to cover. I'm sure that beyond that, we can also see there are many other ways within God's word that we show honor to him. We clearly honor him by serving him. When Jesus Christ was confronted by Satan, and Satan literally wanted Christ in, in a way of submission to bow down, to submit to Satan, Christ understood what was taking place. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, he said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the two do certainly tie in, hand in hand. But at the very same time, brethren, they're also separate. We serve God, and in doing so, we do worship him. But rather, service to God alone is not the worship and honor that comes from the heart that we should give our creator, our Lord God, the Almighty. It just isn't. It goes beyond that. In Psalm 145, the Bible tells us David is a man after God's own heart. And I think one of the best ways to really honor and praise God is to read through and see his spirit in his heart. Throughout his writings and what's given to us, brethren, we see continuously that David honored and praised God his creator. In Psalm 145 in verse 1, which is a praise of David, says, I will extol you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. And I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. He would literally said he would meditate on the very power and the creation of God and on your wondrous works. To me, as I read through the scripture, I believe one of the real keys to honoring God, to praising him, is the recognition that we are a created being. We live in a society that has rejected creation, and people have embraced the concept that somehow they just involved or they were an accident. And one of the aspects, the very fundamental aspects of our calling is to reject that and to understand that we were given life, that it was a blessing. It was not an accident, that God gave life, and we're a recipient of that, and that he created us. He is our maker. And brethren, when we keep that in mind, and we keep that knowledge and, and a focus in our thinking, then we'll find ourselves praising God and worshiping him in a way, perhaps, that if we did not do that, that would not be present. David certainly did. He also did the same regarding God's works, all of the creation that he looked about him. You know, when I was a student in Ambassador College, it was really the time when God began to work in my life. And when I lived in Pasadena, we had prayer booths. And I would go into a booth and and pray and ask God to be with me and guide me and help me to understand and whatever I needed to in in my life. And to be very honest at that time, I didn't really spend a lot of time praising God or in that way worshiping him or thinking about his majesty. It was basically about my experience and what I was going through and, and what I was struggling to understand. But I had the opportunity as a student to go to Big Sandy, Texas, and was blessed to be, as we were later referred to, as the pioneer students. But I was there the summer before the campus opened. 
There were a group of fellows that we were there to work on the grounds to get physically the, the campus cleaned and, and literally went out and cleaned areas of the physical grounds, whether it be to kill thistles or to uh, drop uh, certain trees and remove them so that the uh, woods were spacious or, or just physically do what we could to get the campus ready. But at night, we lived in Booth City. Now, Booth City was not fixed up. All it was was metal floor and a little metal building and what was left in those buildings or what brethren who had used them during the feast had left behind. And so we would go to several booths and assemble together, whatever it might be. And most of the time, it was a bed and a, maybe a bunk, a chair or two. And that was how we lived for the summer. And it was fine. It was a wonderful experience. But there was really no place to just go pray. And so as a student, it became my practice in the evening, before I went to bed, I would walk out into the area that later became and was actually in preparation, the campground. And as I walked at night, in the summer night, you know, the stars in Texas, they're big and bright. And I began to have a totally different experience in my prayer life. As I looked up to the heavens, you know, my focus changed. And I, I hope that, you know, I realize that you may live in an apartment or you may live in, in a city. But I hope, brethren, from time to time that you will do what, as you read in the scripture, you know, Daniel, when he prayed, he went to his window. Others knew he prayed because he was in his window looking up to God of heaven. He wasn't in a closet. So I hope that, you know, and be careful. I realize that sometimes it's not safe, especially if you're a woman alone to be out at night. But during the day or on God's Sabbath, you know, go out and get in God's creation. Think about what he has done and, and what he has created and his tremendous power. David certainly did. He goes on to say here, says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. So he not only spoke of the acts and creation of God, but brethren, as you read through, David also focused a great deal on the very character of God, on his mercy and his compassion, his justice. You know, when we do those things, we honor God. That should be very much a part of your prayers. It should also be very much a part of your thinking in terms of day-to-day -day experience. As we keep God's Sabbath, I'm often asked, well, how should you keep the Sabbath? And we explain, well, we should not be doing our own things. But brethren, why? Why would we make that choice? Because the day is a day of rest. Notice what the scripture brings out, Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. Now we practice these things, but do we understand in part the opportunity we have? It says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him. I'm asked, well, what can I do on the Sabbath? And, and it gets down to sort of a question of, is this okay or that okay? And you know, really, that's not the right focus. The right focus is what's given to us here in God's word. That it's a day of the Lord which is honorable. And what God says in terms of our conduct says, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways. That's the why. It's not a, a matter of rules. It's a rather an opportunity says, so shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. See, when we do that, brother, we honor God. And we do that with an understanding that we honor God. 
then it becomes even more important because it's from the heart. We're doing it with purpose. We're doing it with understanding. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth that the Lord has spoken. How we keep God's Sabbath. If we do it with knowledge and understanding, and we literally seek to honor God, whether it's in our prayer, whether it's in the things we read, whether it's a walk in the park to look out in the wonderful creation, whether it is in sense to fellowship with brethren, whether it's to sing songs in church and sing them from the heart and with a spirit of enthusiasm, whether it is to drink in from the heart the words that God has brought to us, or as we literally bow our heads during the closing prayer, to not be thinking about where we're going or what's next, or we may out, go out to eat with brethren, but literally to be thinking about and concentrating on the very words of the prayer of the individual who have been selected to lead us in group prayer, and maybe in those words to even add our own thoughts. Brethren, in all those things, those are opportunities to honor God, to worship him. Now, there's some other things the Bible also brings out regarding honoring God. One of those is with our possessions. Here in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3, it's in the context of obe obeying the laws of God, his commandments. And certainly, I'll not turn to it, but you can read in the book of Malachi in chapter 3 that God includes in this our tithes and offerings because he challenged Israel and that he said, you have robbed me. And they said, how have we robbed you? What have we done? And the Bible brings out very clearly that they had robbed God in tithes and offerings. Here in Proverbs chapter 3, the instruction to a young man, as it says, my son, in verse 1, in verse 9, it says, honor the Lord with your possessions. That when we tithe, when we give offerings, when we obey that brother, we honor God. We honor a relationship we've entered into him, with him. We literally recognize with those things that we have been blessed with, we recognize our relationship to him. It brings out in part here that it's done even partly in obedience. It says, and with the first fruits of all your increase. As you read the instruction in the Old Testament, you realize they were commanded to give of the first fruits. But you can physically do something, or rather than you can do it with understanding, and you can do it from the heart because your heart is in it. And if your heart is in it and you understand, then you honor God. In Proverbs chapter 14, we need read another passage where God brings out through our physical possessions how we can honor him. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31, it says, He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him, that is his maker, has mercy on the needy. Now, we certainly in our society have to use, and I think man has always needed to use a certain wisdom and understanding. But God makes it clear that the opportunity to help someone else, to truly help them, to lift them up, to be kind toward them, that's an honor to God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, this is an interesting passage, and it's an interesting statement. It was regarding Eli, his son's conduct, and God's response to it. Because Eli was God's servant. He was a man given honor by God. In verse 30 of 1 Samuel chapter 2, it says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, now, as you read through, you see the background of why he says this. 
And it's very clearly justified and understandable. It's explained clearly to us in the scripture. It says, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You know, it's an interesting passage because it also reveals a very important principle, which is confirmed in many other places in the Bible. And that we should not be drawn down to the level of someone whose conduct is not right. God isn't drawn down by those who despise him to despise and show that kind of disrespect and despise them. And so it's stated in a different way. But God says, those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. But what's most important, brethren, and what we should be very aware of in our relationship and our worship, God says, I will those who honor me, I will honor. And that's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous opportunity that we've been given. In Psalm chapter 66, in verse 1, says, make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. As you read through this, you see the word selah, and our best understanding of that is that this was a musical rest, that this literally was a psalm, which was then a song sung by the people of God. What's fascinating, brethren, is that when we assemble, and what we have in God's church is a hymnal and in many, many of those hymns are the very words that were sung by, not, not in the Hebrew language, but the very same meaning has been given to us today to sing and to praise and to worship God. Now, when do you sing them? When I was a student at Ambassador College, on the Sabbath day after brunch, there was always a hymn sing. And I always look forward to it. And I always, as we sang through the hymns, to me in my heart, it was very, very important in terms of my relationship and my heart and attitude towards God. Have you ever, outside of church service, taken God's hymnal and maybe with your family had a hymn sing? Or perhaps if you're together with church members on a camp out, on the Sabbath, taking time to have maybe a 20 or 30 minute hymn sing? Or what do you sing when you go down the road? Do you know the words of our hymnal to the point where you would sing them as you travel down the freeway? To sing perhaps of God's mercy or of his greatness or the time of his judgment? I, I know personally that, and, and I understand, you know, we... I would not do that. I don't do that all the time, but there are times I do. I also, a few years ago, came to realize, particularly because it was around the holiday season of this society around Christmas time, that I would be driving down the road and here there was this, you know, bouncy uh, tune, uh, whether it be Jingle Bells or, or whatever, and, or Silent Night, and I would find myself without thinking about it either sometimes singing along or humming particularly because I have a habit of humming. It goes all the way back to my youth when I played baseball and I had a coach who realized that when I was put in a game in a tight position, I, I tended to get uptight and a little nervous. And he had played professional baseball. In fact, the year uh, 
that he was my coach the year before he had been, played with the Chicago Cubs. And he told me, he said, I want you to just hum. <laughs> and he, he, he told me, and I, of course, he was my, at that time in my life, he was like my idol. Here I was being coached as a young man, about 12, 13 years of age, by a professional baseball player. And so whatever he said, it was the law. And so I consciously began to hum. Now, at that time, I hummed, and I tried to sing along. You know, it was rock and roll. It was Elvis or whatever at the time. But I developed a habit today, quite often subconsciously, without thinking about it, I will hum. And I found myself humming along with the things of this world, whether it be Silent Night or Jingle Bells. And, you know, I, in God's word, he says, not only that he hates those practices, he says, I hate your music. And I thought, here I am, humming along to music God hates. And it really made me stop and think about what should I be singing, what should I be humming, and it influenced my, and, and actually made me change and, and focused on learning some of the hymns, being more focused on uh, the things that we sing in God's church. So I challenge you, do you know the hymns? Do you sing them? Are they just a part of Sabbath? Or do you sing them occasionally in the shower? Or, and it's not just the hymns in our hymnal. There are also other very beautiful music. Songs like I'll Walk With God that have been traditionally sung in the church of God as special music on special occasions. And there's a lot of other beautiful music that has been written that is in praise to God. But do you do that? Do you think that way? I hope, brethren, as a result of this message, you will. That it'll make you, as you come to church services, participate from the heart in the song service. I hope that in your prayers, that you will spend more time in praising God. That in your day-to-day -day life, you'll spend more time focusing on his creation. That in your relationship and thinking about God, you will spend more time thinking about his very character, and praise him for it. In the book of Psalms, you'll find that David continually praised God for his mercy. I'll point out one Psalm, Psalm 136, verse 1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for his, he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And he repeats this, and he repeats it. And then, brethren, he goes into areas of God's mercy and his intervention. And God's people did not forget the hand of God when it intervened in their life. It was not part of the past. It was part of their living relationship and their thankfulness. You can read in Psalm 106, 107, 118, where David praised God for the mercy that he shows. You read in Psalm 103 where David praised God for all his blessings, how he has blessed us. And it caused him to praise God. Psalm 103, verse 1, says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and bless all that is and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, God has greatly blessed us. We live in a time of great blessings, and we should be very, very thankful for them. Many psalms instruct us to praise God. In Psalm chapter 67... Psalm 67, verse 3, says, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Again in verse 5, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. David said in Psalm 146, in verse 2, regarding his commitment and his heart, Verse 1, Psalm 146, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. 
while I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. He also said in Psalm chapter 47, and you can read a similar passage in Psalm 104 and verse 33. In Psalm chapter 47, excuse me, this is no, what I just read in Psalm 146 is very similar to one, chapter 104 and verse 33. Here in Psalm chapter 47 and verse 6, it brings out a point that Mr. Armstrong brought out regarding what we sing. And that is that the words we sing need to be true to God's word. There's a lot of religious music that we do not use in God's church. And the reason, brethren, is twofold. One, and first and foremost, is that the message is wrong. That it carries a false message. But a second reason also is that the emotion of it is wrong. It has a wrong kind of emotion. Here in Psalm chapter 47 and verse 6, it says, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. And so what we sing, we should think about. And rather than the words we sing should be words that are true. So I, I would implore you, and the things we practice in God's church were, are by commandment, by instruction. And whether it's to come to the Sabbath or keep God's holy days, or whether it's in our personal prayer, or whether it's when you're perhaps lifted and, and joy and, and a delightful occasion, that you use those occasions to honor God, to worship Him. And when you make a decision to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that you understand, brother, we're going to keep the Feast but you also understand first and foremost, as we read in the book of Zechariah, that we've come to worship the Lord our King, the God of hosts, that we're there to worship, and that in our practice, in our relationship to God, that we worship Him, our Creator. 